Okay, in this video we're going to talk about aromaticity in a bit more detail, but to begin that discussion, I thought it would be useful for us to go back uh, all the way to when benzene was first discovered and to briefly talk about the process by which chemists came to understand its chemical structure. So it turns out that benzene was actually first isolated in 1825 by Michael Faraday. Now you probably know Faraday much more for his work in electromagnetism, but it turns out that Faraday was a phenomenally broad and talented scientist. And one of the things he did was to isolate this new substance from the oily residue that was left over um, from burning oil in street lamps in London. Now what he isolated, uh, which we now know as benzene, um, was this clear, colorless, uh, and actually very pleasant smelling liquid. Um, he certainly didn't understand the structure, and in fact a, a coherent theory of organic structure was not available at that time. Uh, but he did in fact isolate it, and it was uh, actually readily available um, by such techniques. He termed it uh, bicarburet of, of hydrogen, uh, but the name obviously didn't stick. So it wasn't until uh, almost 10 years later uh, that Meesterlich uh, first determined the molecular formula of benzene, not the structure, but just the formula, as being C6H6. Now this was actually a huge surprise, because what this meant was that benzene had four degrees of unsaturation, right? So let's remind ourselves how we get to degrees of unsaturation. There's two ways, essentially. We can either have a double bond or a triple bond, um, or we can have a ring. So for example, if we look at hexane here, this is a fully saturated molecule because each carbon is attached to the maximum number of hydrogens. If we put in an alkene, we have one degree of unsaturation. If we put in three alkenes, we have three degrees. And then another way to get a degree of unsaturation would be to take hexane and form it into cyclohexane, and that would be also be one degree of unsaturation. <clears throat> So the question is, how do we get to four degrees of unsaturation? Well, uh, one, there's a lot of possibilities, and, and so chemists really uh, struggled with this. Um, and I just show some of the, uh, the structures that were proposed uh, for benzene. Uh, now, a lot of these look very uh, silly to the modern eye, uh, but keep in mind, uh, this is before people even knew that atoms were real. Um, and they certainly didn't know the structure of atoms, let alone uh, the nature of, of bonding or what have you. Um, so actually these guesses aren't so terrible. Um, but you can see that some of these structures, um, you know, make a good attempt at, at how you can get these four degrees of unsaturation um, with only six carbons. But of course, none of these were actually um, correct. Um, and it wasn't until um, a guy by the name of Kekulé uh, came along it, that uh, the, the sort of right structure of benzene was proposed. Um, and so what it uh, looks like here is a, a cyclohexatriene. So this was proposed in 1865. <clears throat> that, that, again, it's, it's the structure we actually use today, um, but thinking of it as a cyclohexatriene actually is not accurate, um, and we'll, we'll be talking about that. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> it, the, the story that Kekulé um, related many years after the fact was that he had the idea for uh, this, this cyclic structure of benzene when he, uh, he, had a, he fell asleep and had a dream about a snake uh, biting its tail. And it, many people now think that this is um, apocryphal, this didn't actually happen. Um, but anyway, it makes a, a nice um, a nice story, um, and uh, if for some reason you're interested, there's a um, a Greek myth um, surrounding a, a snake biting its tail, and it's called Ouroboros. So you could go to Wikipedia and, and learn more about that. So at any rate, um, this idea of having a cyclohexatriene uh, was uh, still still didn't seem accurate. Right, and so deciding between it and some of these other structures really wasn't possible um, at, in the 1860s and, and, uh, and beyond. Um, because uh, the, none of these seemed right, and, and one of the reasons is that uh, you would expect a molecule with 
so many degrees of unsaturation to undergo the chemical reactions that uh, unsaturated compounds were known to undergo, right? So uh, you all have now uh, learned many of the reactions that alkenes are expected to undergo, right? So things like reaction with uh, Br2, HBr, hydrogenation with a catalyst or oxidation with KMnO4. All these things uh, are, are readily done to most alkenes, but benzene, if you treat them under the same conditions, does not react. It doesn't react with any of these things. And so you can imagine how um, extremely confusing this was, that here we have a molecule with an unprecedented number of degrees of unsaturation, and it is not undergoing any of these reactions. So, so what is happening? What is this structure that seems to be so very stable? <clears throat> Another important piece of evidence um, in terms of the structure is that benzene does in fact undergo certain types of reactions. Um, but what it typically does is substitution reactions and not addition reactions that you would expect for alkenes. So for example, if you take benzene and you treat it with bromine, again, nothing happens. But if you add a catalyst, like an iron tribromide catalyst, you actually do get a product, but it's not the addition product that you would get with a normal alkene. It's actually the substitution product where one of the hydrogens has been replaced with a bromine. This is a reaction we'll talk about in more detail, but you can see that this is very much different than what you would expect for a normal degree of unsaturation. Another bit of evidence is that monosubstitution only ever produces a single isomer. Okay, so what that suggests is that you've got a highly symmetrical structure. So some of these um, more um, you know, inventive things that were proposed for benzene um, wouldn't seem to fit with this uh, bit of evidence that you only get a single isomer ever. Um, uh, when you substitute benzene. The final piece of evidence here is that if you do dye substitution, so add two substituents, you only get three and not four isomers. Okay, so if I add uh, two bromines to the benzene ring, um, what can be shown is that there are three isomers. There's a 1-2 relationship, a 1-3, and a 1-4. But now think about it. If this if benzene was a cyclohexatriene, you would expect there should be two different 1-2 isomers. So there would be this one here where each bromine is attached to its own alkene, its own carbon-carbon double bond. But there should also be this alternative where both bromines are attached to the same alkene. But in fact, these are completely indistinguishable from one another. Um, and in fact, they are the exact same compound. So <clears throat> the uh, cyclohexatriene view of benzene does not match this data, but um, an alternative, which, which we'll talk about, uh, very much does match. Okay, so Calculate tried to get around this um, uh, lack of a fourth isomer um, by basically proposing that, well, maybe these, uh, these positional isomers uh, rapidly interconvert. And that's not so unreasonable, to, to be honest. And the idea was that um, the alkenes are just bouncing back and forth, and so, of course, you would only see one of them. Um, it's not unreasonable, but it's actually not correct either. And, and so I put this is not correct in, in red and underlined. And that's because I feel it is extremely important for you to grasp this. Okay, so insofar as you continue to view um, benzene as being the rapid interconversion of these isomers, you do not understand aromaticity. Okay, it is not the interconversion of cyclohexatrienes. It is com something completely different. So please keep this red and underlined um, idea in your mind. Okay, so what is it instead? Well, it turns out that uh, the, the cyclic conjugation of benzene is what is responsible for this property of aromaticity, and it's what gives it its very special properties. So if we think about rather than this, this two-dimensional Lewis structure, if we think a little bit more about what's happening from an orbital point of view, think about each carbon. Each carbon is sp2 hybridized, which you could probably see, right? And so what that means is every carbon has a p orbital, and they're all going to be aligned in the same way, um, and each carbon is, is donating a single electron to this, um, uh, to this cyclic conjugation, okay? So what that leads to is rather than having isolated 
uh, double bonds, so this carbon and that carbon each sharing one electron in a double bond, it turns out that all six of these electrons can be shared equally all around the ring. Right? So that's fundamentally different. Um, another way to represent this would be, rather than having isolated p orbitals, is to show that the orbitals can, can all sort of mix together to make one molecular orbital. And so you get this common depiction of a, of a sort of a donut Right? And so, of course, there would be a component above and below the plane of the benzene. <clears throat> and so, at least uh, conceptually, that's, that's quite accurate. Um, it's a little bit cartoonified here, and we don't actually have purple donuts in our benzene. Um, and, you know, you might get a little bit better sense of something closer to reality by looking at this electrostatic map. So, this would be a little bit closer to the, the actual uh, electron cloud surrounding benzene. And you can see that it is sort of a donut there. Um, and uh, this is actually color-coded, so the points of highest electron density are going to be closer to red and orange, um, and, then, and then green and, and blue is the, the points of uh, lower electron density. And you can see that nice little orange uh, donut ring in the benzene. So that's what we have. And so a more accurate uh, drawing of benzene might actually be this here, where we, we draw the, the ring structure and then put a, a little circle to depict this sort of complete cyclic conjugation. What we mean by this, then, is a perfect 50% 50, 50 resonance contribution from each of these two cyclohexatriene-looking isomers. Now, again, keep in mind that, that resonance forms um, are, are not real, okay? Uh, what's real is when you combine the resonance forms into one thing, okay? So these are, are limitations of our ability to represent molecules uh, on a piece of paper or in two dimensions, okay? So please try to keep in mind that, that neither of these are accurate. In, fi in fact, both of these representations have their benefits and their drawbacks. So the benefit of this little donut representation, which you're welcome to use, by the way, uh, the benefit is that it it provides a somewhat more realistic um, depiction of what's actually happened with that complete cyclic conjugation. So that's good. What it doesn't do, though, is it doesn't allow us to do a proper um, accounting of the electrons, and that becomes very important when we uh, start drawing mechanisms um, in the next uh, section. Um, so, so that's a major drawback of doing the little donut thing. Uh, on the other hand, um, doing the, the cyclohexatriene depiction um, allows for that uh, electron accounting. It's very amenable to drawing mechanisms and keeping track of charge and electrons. And in fact, uh, as a professional organic chemist, this is uh, exclusively um, the form that I draw uh, benzene rings in. But again, you, you have to keep in mind that this is not accurate. This actually uh, doesn't provide that accurate description of the um, full conjugation. And so you, uh, if you use this form, you do have to keep in mind that there's an absolutely um, equal and appropriate resonance form that has the double bonds shifted. So both of them have their flaws. Um, I think you can probably use whichever one you want, but I will keep uh, ask you to keep in mind that when we draw mechanisms, um, you are really going to probably want to use this depiction. Okay. So it turns out that this idea then of, of uh, benzene as having uh, full conjugation um, corresponds very well to the known structure of benzene. So if you get an X-ray crystal structure um, of benzene and you look at the position of the atoms, um, you can see this, this symmetry. So let's just remind ourselves, a typical carbon-carbon single bond has a length of about one point, uh, one and a half angstroms, let's say. A carbon-carbon double bond, on average, is, is usually going to be about 1.3 angstroms. And if we look at the, um, so we can also look at the, the bond lengths in something like 1,3-butadiene, uh, right? So here, we've got a little bit of conjugation between the two double bonds, just a little bit, right? So we still see uh, more or less the bond lengths that we would expect for the double bonds, about 1.34 angstroms. And then the carbon-carbon double bond is actually a little bit shorter than your typical CC bond, 
okay? It's shorter because there is some communication, some conjugation between these two alkenes, and that actually gives that single bond a little bit of double bond character, okay? So that's what conjugation does for you. Now, in the case of benzene with, with uh, perfect resonance, perfect conjugation, um, every bond ends up being the same. They're all the same length, right? Um, and uh, so the, that length actually turns out to be just shy of, of 1.4 angstroms. So every single bond is the same. And it turns out that each of those bonds is sort of halfway between a single and a double bond. And that's what you would expect if you take two cyclohexatriene isomers and merge them together. Um, you would expect each one of those carbon-carbon linkages to be halfway between a single and a double bond. So that, that seems to actually make um, quite a bit of sense. Okay, so the, the physical reality matches up to this vision. But it turns out, though, that cyclic conjugation in and of itself isn't enough to give us aromaticity. And the best way to see that is if we look at a different ring size. So if we looked at cyclooctatetrine, here we've got uh, full conjugation, or sorry, we have uh, unsaturation all the way around the ring, right? So, so every carbon could, in theory, donate uh, a p orbital with a single electron. So that just looks like a bigger version of benzene. But it turns out that this is absolutely not aromatic. And in fact, it's not planar at all either. Um, it, it actually adopts this tub shape. And if you were to do chemistry on a cyclooctatetrine, each of these alkenes reacts pretty much just like a normal alkene would. So you get all the same uh, addition products that you would expect with normal alkenes. So, so something is clearly dramatically different here between the six-membered ring and the eight-membered ring. Well, so we'd like to understand that. And then just to go the other way, we can look at cyclobutadiene, right? So this is another one where we can have the same uh, apparent um, conjugation all the way around the ring. Um, but cyclobutadiene is, is essentially so reactive that you can't even isolate it. And it's been isolated at very low temperatures, but it is wildly reactive. In fact, it's much more reactive than a corresponding um, alkene would be. Um, now, granted, there's strain involved, but that does not uh, begin to explain the reactivity. So there's something very different going on with these species, and, and so uh, the, we're missing a, a key piece of aromaticity, and, and that's what we want to understand in the next lecture.